Shalom Church. Wow, what an encouraging testimony. And uh, this is KL Zone. Thank you, Pastor Allen, for leading the zone. And this is one zone out of the 13 zones that are in the English celebration, uh, congregation. And 17 cell groups out of about 208 uh, cell groups in DUMC. And so amazingly, just this one zone doing such amazing work with 71 projects and raise up some money and even help 160 plus immigrants uh, to get their vaccination. What an amazing story. And so we're going to hear some of these stories more and more uh, in the next uh, four weeks. And uh, so right now, as you can see, I'm live streaming all the way from Dream Center. And uh, so I miss this uh, pulpit here. And so it's so great to be coming back. And so gradually in this month, October, we're going to get uh, more and more people in. But uh, in the month of November, you know, we will open up for in-person celebrations, so be ready to get your ticketing uh, because we want to prepare the place. We are looking into the ventilation, uh, into the whole area of air purification so that by the time you come back here, you know, it will be a place that where we mitigate uh, the risk entirely for COVID-19. All right? So, so glad to be uh, here. And those who are here for the first time, I'd like to welcome you. I'm the senior pastor of DUMC. So on behalf of the church, I would like to welcome you. Now, this pandemic is like uh, what I call a blip in the history of mankind. It is a very unusual season that we are living in, and certainly it presented to us some really unusual opportunities. And so that is why we are doing our impact now, and this is a response to that blip in the history of mankind in that sense. And so you'll be hearing stories, like I mentioned earlier on, some stories of how our ministries and cell groups are reaching out to thousands of people out there in our community. And so let's continue uh, to do that. Let's keep going. If you remember, this is the theme for this year. Keep going is the encouragement to you, you know, in the midst of this pandemic that we can still do things that will bless the hearts of many in our midst. So as we draw near to the end of the year, I just felt the Lord wanted me to do this. As a spiritual family, let's do what I call a touchdown. And that is why this series is called Touchdown. Now, what does touchdown mean? Now, touchdown could be a plane coming down, all right, and touching down uh, on the runway. Or a touchdown is also in the, for example, a rugby uh, game where a touchdown scores point. And so this is what we want to do during this touchdown series. We want to be able, you know, to land, land the, the, the plane impact now and begin to reflect what is God telling us and what is God helping us to see where He wants us to go. So that's a touchdown. And the, the other touchdown is a touchdown of a point, a scoring a point, a win. So let's, as a spiritual family, you know, come together right now and see what God has been doing in the last 17, 18 months. And it's incredible. I hear so many stories. And KL Zone is only one story out of the many zones that we have and the other five con uh, congregations of the church as well. So we want to come together in this season of touchdown here in the next four weeks to celebrate the good that God has been doing. And so in this impact now, uh, touchdown, we want to just pause and ask ourselves, even as we consider our tagline, to love God. Now, what does it mean to love God? If you love God, you will serve people. And through serving people, we are making disciples to be more like Christ, towards Christ's likeness. And in serving, in other words, we have Jesus, becoming more like Jesus in our life. So here's a series right now uh, to look into the different aspects of serving. I pray that this will be a great time for you to reflect and begin to ask God, what is God saying to you? And so we want to start this whole series on Impact Touchdown. Uh, in some sense, right, it's going to be a difficult and uncomfortable message first, the first sermon, right? Uh, from, taken from Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 10. Now, this is one of those passages that many preachers wish that it's not their turn to preach. And, but to be faithful, you know, I often reminded myself that we need to preach the whole counsel of God. Even if it disturbs us, we need to preach on the Word of God so that we are transformed to be more and more like Jesus. So we should not just be listening to things that we want to hear, but we need to listen to things that we need to hear. So trust me on this one. As much as God is speaking to you, He has spoken to me first. 
because in the preparation from God's Word, He has truly convicted my own heart. So we want to read the Bible right now. So will you leave your Bible wherever you are at home right now? Lift up your Bible. You know what to do. This is my Bible. Are you ready? Okay, just stand up. Let's honor the Word of God. And then we're going to read from the screen uh, this passage from Luke chapter 17, verse seven, verses 7 to 10. Are you ready? Okay, this is my Bible. One, two, go. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It informs my mind, inspires my heart, and instructs my behavior. So help me, God. So let's read from Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 10. Are you ready? One, two, go. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant, when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Wouldn't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? And after that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Holy Spirit, will you come now, Lord, and illumine our minds? We want to not only just learn from the Word of God, but to appropriate it, Lord, right into our heart and our spirit that it may change, Lord, the way we live our lives. So bless everyone watching this, that, Lord, they may, Lord, have the shalom peace of God as they learn to listen to your voice, God. And we pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Now, we don't hear a lot of sermons preached on this particular passage. I don't know whether you even remember any sermon preached on this text. But, you know, in some sense, I would rather preach on text that talks about how God bless you and how Jesus, uh, you know, will come along and, and make your life a success. Those are much easier, you know, uh, passages uh, to preach from. But I think to preach about what Jesus uh, demands of us, not how Jesus is blessing us, but what Jesus demands of us is something else because it, sometimes this kind of message would bother us. Now, why would I say that? Because it offends our 21st century mindset. Now, what do I mean by that? Because in many sense, we are driven by what I call a consumeristic mentality. And so we ask ourselves, what's in for me? And what's beneficial for me? what's in for me, myself, and I. I call it the idol of our life. I am the idol of my own life. And th so this story here is addressed to the disciples, to the followers of Jesus. This story here is not for the general crowd. It is for those of us who say we love Jesus and we are following Him. And so in that sense, you know, it is addressed to us as disciples of Jesus and what is Jesus' experience? expectation of his disciples, the followers of Christ. And so here's the big idea, the job description of the follower of Christ. Now, let me repeat that. The job description of the follower of Christ. Now, before I unpack this passage for you, now, you need to understand the word servant that is in the NIV, which is actually translated from the Greek word doulos. Now, this word is often translated also into the word slave. So servant and slave actually means the same thing. And if you were to study the Word of God, do a word search, this word doulos is mentioned 38 times by Apostle Paul. Now, what's a doulos, who is a servant or slave? A doulos has no rights. He received no wages, and he has no rights to appeal whatever that is done, so-called wrong, towards him. In other words, in the times of Jesus, slaves are actually very common. 20 to 30% of the population of the Roman Empire were actually slaves. So one in three people are actually slaves. You see them around. And so they were very, it's a very common sight to see slaves, and they are actually an acceptable social norm in the lives of those during the Roman Empire. So I'm going to use that phrase, servant, and slave interchangeably because it means the same thing. And so, once again, let me remind you that this is a conversation that G Jesus had with his disciples. It is something very common to talk about where slave is concerned. Of course, for us now, if we were to talk about slaves, it is very uncommon because we don't see that in our, in our society anymore, at least in Malaysia. And so, you know, 
So it, it gets rather interesting as we now follow that progress in that conversation that Jesus then says something else at the end of that conversation where it blew their mind. I want you to be ready also that it will also blow our mind. So are you ready? So let me unpack this particular passage for you. So he started off by saying this, suppose one of you has a servant. Suppose one of you has a slave. So Jesus is saying, imagine with me. So he told the disciples, imagine with me. Now, like I said, it wasn't difficult for the disciples to imagine with Jesus because slaves are very normal in those times. Then Jesus asked three rhetorical questions. Now, each of these questions here, I think, for me personally, is a leading question based on the culture they were in. So it's a leading question with an obvious answer. It's almost like us meeting a friend in the coffee shop and he's eating there. And then we ask the most obvious question, are you eating lunch? <laughs> so we do that all the time. And so this is, a, this is a cliche, a rhetorical question with an obvious answer. So he, let me quote from that passage again. Now, verse 7. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant, when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Now, I want you to imagine the disciples, all of them, will be shaking their heads. Of course not. So notice the word a servant. There's only one servant, meaning there is no extra help. No extra help at all, only one slave and one servant. So the servant does everything. If you are a slave during that time, it is common for you to get up early in the morning and do your household duties, and then you will go out to the fields owned by uh, the owner, the master, and you would take care of his crops, and then you would tend his sheep. And having done all that, when you come back in the late afternoon, you know, and here precisely at this moment, that question was asked, will he say to the servant, when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? So here's the obvious uh, answer. No, of course, the disciples were shaking their head. Would any slave or servant be expected to eat first before the master? Now, remember, there's only one servant, so he has to do everything. So what was the next thing that the master said? Now, notice verse 8. Wouldn't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Now, what does this tell you? It tells you there's no extra help, there's also no time off. And so the disciples understood that and they nodded, nodded their heads. Of course, the slaves would have to prepare the meal for the master first. They understood what a slave needed to do, everything that the master asked him to do. So imagine with me, right? the disciples were imagining this. So immediately after you come back as a slave from the field, you will begin to prepare the meal for your master and his family. And then you will serve their food first, and then you go on and do other household duties. And finally, when you washed up after the family has eaten, then only would you sit down and then eat your meal, wash up, and go to sleep. And do you know that happens 365 days a year? Because that's what a slave would do. So imagine there's no extra help, there is no time off. Now that comes, here comes the third question. Will he, then verse 9, will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Will he thank the servant because he was told what he ought to be doing? Once again, the disciples are always shaking their heads. Of course not. Of course not. The master will not thank the servant because that's not how things work. It's his responsibility. It's his duty. So here's the third aspect. Not only that no extra help, no time off, no thank you. You don't get the thank you. The slave is always a debtor of service. He's always a debtor of service. He owes the master service. And the master never a debtor of rewards because the master doesn't owe anything to the slave. No thank you. So in that sense, then here comes the shocking part of the whole conversation because the disciples were imagining themselves as the master, of course, 
There's no extra help. There's no time off and no thank you. And then Jesus turned the table on them. So what did Jesus say in verse 10? He said this, So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now you see, the disciples were all thinking of themselves as masters because they are free men. And so now Jesus turned the whole thing around and said, now you be the slave. So the whole table is turned. And I think there was a shock look on every disciple that were there. And so the master now has become the slave. And tell you what, Jesus will not ask us to do something he has not already done. Now let me refer you to Mark chapter 10, verses 43 to 45. Here he says, instead, these, these are the words of Jesus. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want you to notice verse 43. Must, must be slave of all. That means you, Jesus, and you as the disciples of Jesus must be the slave of all. And that word slave is the word doulos. So now this is the teaching of that passage. Now let me help you apply them. Now, I know there's a sense of discomfort in us right now. What does it mean to, for me to be a slave? So let me help you apply. So the first thing, the first two things that was mentioned is that no extra help and no time off. Now what does that mean as disciples and followers of Jesus? You know, sometimes when we do something, when, or in a ministry, or when we serve God, you know, I don't know about you, but I do that, you know, on and off. We tend to complain that maybe sometimes we have to do a little more, and then we start comparing with the people around us, you know, and we even complain to God and say, God, I'm doing so much. Why are some of these people not doing anything, you know? And, but this passage reminds me, it's not about what other people are doing. It is about me as a servant and slave of Christ. It is not for me to compare and complain about to Jesus or to God about what other people are doing or not doing. At the end of the day, it's about my accountability to God. I am not to worry about other people because I'm a slave, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am accountable to God. And when I serve God, I am serving an audience of one. I may be, for example, I'm preaching right now. I, in some sense, I, I have only one audience. My audience is my master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I know, in some sense, I'm preaching to you, but really, at the end of the day, I'm serving my master. You know, just like in a worship celebration, many of you will be, will be sitting here and worshiping the Lord. You know, actually, you are not the audience when you are in a worship celebration. You know who's the audience? Christ, God. Is the audience. And therefore, you are the performer. You are performing, performing in that sense. You are singing, you are celebrating towards God. And the role of the worship team is to help you right, to perform to God. So we are all serving the audience of one. My role as a slave of Christ is to please my master, not the hearer. And I need to get that right because it is to my master that I owe my allegiance to. And this is the responsibility of every follower of Christ. So here's the question. Here's the question. Do we do all this, the, all this grudgingly and with complaints? It's a good time to reflect right now. That many of us may have been serving God a long time. And some of us are getting maybe even tired, maybe, you know, even coming to a place of discomfort, and then we start comparing with people around, and we say, God, it's not fair. And then this passage reminded me, hey, I'm serving Christ. I'm not serving people. And if I'm really serving Christ, I'm reminded that Jesus paid a heavy price. God sent His Son, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to be a servant of all. And that is why, having done all that, I appreciate what God is doing. Remember that hymn, that hymn, that hymn that we sang with such gusto. I surrender all. I surrender all. And we sing that with such conviction, but do we really know 
what it means. I surrender all, not surrender one-tenth. How I need to surrender all. And that's being a servant of Christ, a slave of Christ. Now, those of us who are working, when you're given an offer letter, remember there's always that one clause right at the end of that offer letter or job description, so-called. And this is what it will say. Usually it will come in these two forms here. It will say in that one line, complete other duties at the discretion of management. Or it may say, other duties are assigned from time to time. Remember that line? Maybe you have forgotten. But that is in your job description. In Bahasa, we call it dan, line, line, lagi. Do you know that's our job description as well as servant of, of Christ? And therefore, it is our responsibility to find out what God wants us to do and to be faithful in. So, as a servant of Christ, as a slave of Christ, no extra help, no time off, and no thank you. So in verse 9, it says that, will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Of course not. God doesn't owe us a thank you. All right. So if you remember the, the book of Hebrews that we have just preached through, and over and over again, remember I said, this is nothing we can do to save ourselves. It's not as if we have worked so hard to save ourselves that God owes us something. No. In fact, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. It's purely God's grace. And when we live under God's grace, we simply, therefore, from then on, serve under that grace. God doesn't owe us anything. In fact, we owe God everything. So God doesn't owe us even a thank you in that sense. Have you ever received a letter from the government? Or anywhere else for that matter that says the following? <laughs> Listen to this letter. It's a fictitious letter which I wrote. But have you ever received this letter here? So I address it to myself here. Okay? So I say that, Dear Mr. Kam, the government of Malaysia wishes to thank you for housing, feeding, and educating your three children all the 18 years of their life. We just want to express our deepest appreciation to you for doing that by refunding you 10% of all the income tax you have paid and a plaque to hang on your wall that reads, thank you for being a father from the government of Malaysia. <laughs> now, how many of you here would love to receive a letter like that? Of course not. The government is not going to send you a letter for something that you ought to be doing because it's your duty and your responsibility. They don't owe you a thank you. No one owes you any thank you in that sense because it is your duty to have, a ch have your children and it is your responsibility to have your children. And so as a follower of Jesus, you know, we will live our life on this earth here until the day he takes us home. And let me say to you, you will not get a thank you note or an email from God in your letterbox. Neither will you get an email from God, dear Chris, thank you for serving me, love God. I don't think I will ever get this letter until when I go to him. But tell you what, however, I'm thankful that God does give me a hint that he remembers everything I do on earth. Now, how do I know that? If you go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, and this is what he says there, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. What a comfort that although I may not receive a thank you note from God, but he says, I will remember. I will remember. And so, here's the big idea again. The job description of the follower of Christ, that passage. And what is that job description? Everything Jesus tells you to do. That's our job description. And so here comes a crunch. Have you done all that? Verse 10. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now, not only do you not get the thank you note, 
Now you say, I am unworthy. Actually, I'm not fit to even serve. I am only doing my duty. No need to thank me. Ouch. That's hard to take, isn't it? After working so hard, after serving so hard, and God is saying, actually, you're unworthy. Now, this is, these are not my words. These are the words of Jesus. Right? And so, the Greek word for unworthy actually means worthless. It can also mean useless or good for nothing. Also, another, it literally means we are expendable. All right? Do you realize that God actually doesn't need us? Let me repeat that. Do you realize that God actually doesn't need us? It's the other way around. You know, in my earlier part of my Christian life, I remember as a young Christian, I always thought that God needed me. <laughs> right? And uh, I, I told God, I've got lots to offer. I'm quite good in this, I'm quite good in that. God, I think you can use me. And I have, you know what I've learned in my life up to this point here? That whenever, whenever this balloon of pride comes into my life, it comes to a certain size, okay? And God has a certain kind of pen that he will use and burst that balloon. And he does that often for the balloon of pride. There's another balloon that he will burst, and it's called the balloon of satisfaction. Lord, I've done all I need to do already. Lord, I've done my time. You know, maybe it's time now, you know, I, I back off, right? And so that's called a balloon of satisfaction. And whenever that comes, uh, God will burst that balloon. You see, as a servant, as a slave of Christ, I don't get to decide. It is Jesus or God the Father who decides. As long as he wants me to, I will keep going until the day I go home. See, while it's true that he doesn't need us, you know what? What's the, what's the, what is it like to live under grace? Although while it's true that he doesn't need us, he chose or he chose to use us. And this is where I call it, it is a privilege to serve this living God. And he makes us useful for the kingdom of God. So let me end by saying this. While a sense of duty is very important, it is not the highest motivation in serving God. See, that's the least you must do to be dutiful, all right? But the highest motivation is a life of service of love. Your motivation is out of love, not just out of duty, although by right, yes, you are servant of Christ, you should serve out duty. But that's never the highest motivation. The highest motivation is love. Remember the story of Jacob. He got a raw deal from his conniving and sneaky father-in-law, Laban, or Laban. And he worked the first seven years uh, thinking that he would marry Rachel, but was given Leah instead the older daughter. Then he works another seven years before he actually married Rachel. And interesting, look at Genesis 29, verse 20. It says, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but it seemed like only, not this phrase, only a few days to him because of his love for her. So sweet, <laughs> right? So cute, I call it. You see, his motivation for working the 14 years was not just out of duty. It was because it was out of love. And therefore, the 14 years seemed like a few days. So let me, let me reiterate this passage one more time. That it's not talking about God. This passage is talking about us our serving posture and our attitude. And it's based on our relationship, our walk with God. And that's what I think Apostle Paul understood. Because he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 5, verse 14, he said, for Christ's love compels us. So, tell you what, even having served God faithfully your entire life, and some of you have been doing that, thank God for that. And whether you have sweated blood or tears, given all you can, and even to suffer, to come out of your comfort zone and conveniences, and at the end of the day, there's no extra help, there's no time off, and no thank you, and admittedly, you will even say to God, I'm unworthy servant, I have only done my duty. Now, having said all that, can you still say to Jesus at the end of your life, Jesus, 
it is all still worth it. Now, that's the posture God is helping us to work out. This is hard teaching, by the way. I started off by saying this is difficult. In fact, there are so many hard teachings from Jesus that the Bible tells us that his disciples were offended. In fact, John chapter 6, verse 66 says this, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now, some of you may not be, even be aware of this particular verse because the demands of Jesus is so high that there are some people who were offended and they turned away from Jesus. You know, as I was preparing, like I say, it's not just about you. It came to me first, this passage. And I reflected. I had a good time of reflection. And I thought of that day in 1983. That's many years ago. 1983, when I was 23 years old, as a student in Melbourne. I was at a mission conference in church, the time in Melbourne. And it was an altar call. And this speaker made a call. An altar call to say it's a call of obedience. He made it clear it's not a call to full-time ministry, whether it's to be a, a Christian minister or whether to be a Christian missionary. No, it's just a call of obedience. And those who want to obey the call of obedience, you walk forward. And it hit me at 23 years old, and I walked forward. Now, thank God I did not walk forward alone. 63 of us students walked forward. And lo and behold, one of the 63 people were actually my wife-to-be then. We were not courting at all. But I only found out later that she was one of the 63. And then we came back to Malaysia, fall in love, fell in love, and then we got married. And six years after we were married, I was challenged to come on full-time in DUMC in 1994. The six years after we were married. And as I come on full-time to work in DUMC, I had to take a 70% pay cut. That's a huge pay cut, 70%. And uh, at that time, my wife, we had one child. And uh, my wife agreed to journey with me. Why? Why? Because both of us were committed to a call of obedience. And then years later, when I became a senior pastor of DUMC in 2016, my wife heard a very clear call from God to leave a corporate job. She has been there in a the corporate job for the last 27 years. And so it means something to her, but the Lord told her very clearly, leave that. Go and help out your husband. And she obeyed the Lord. Now, this is just some of the many things that happened to us, which really challenged our comfort zone. But we heeded the call, not because it was a very easy thing to do. In fact, it goes against the grain of what we would do and on the normal side of life. It was very uncomfortable. But why did we do what we did? Why do we do what we did? It's simply because when the master called, we say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. In looking back, while it did cost us certain things, but tell you what, we experience amazing provision and faithfulness of God, which we would have never otherwise experienced. And this is an amazing thing that when God calls us to something, while it may really put us into a very uncomfortable zone, but yet that is probably one of the best experiences of our life. And Jesus asked me, as a final note, in my preparation of this sermon, because I'm also not so young anymore, okay? And I serve God almost, you know, by the time I so-called officially retire, I'll be about 30 years in the ministry. And so I was working this through. And, and this is what I wrote. Chris, when you finally finish up with what you're doing in ministry, there's no thank you. There's no even dinners. There's no goodbyes, no accolades, but just ride quietly into the sunset. Is that okay for you? Now, I wrote that down because this passage here spoke to me in a very powerful way. And I, I worked through that. 
And I honestly wrote this answer down for myself. And I said, yes, it's okay. Even if I don't get any of those things. Why? Because I finally understood it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And that is why if we really understand the meaning of a servant and a slave of Christ, we will understand that we are actually unworthy. We are unworthy to serve even God. And what he has given to us is a privilege. Now, a friend of mine wrote this song when we were students. That was many years ago when he wrote this song. And it's still ringing in my head. And that song goes this way. Where he leads, I will follow. Where he sends me, I am prepared to go. For as long as is in his will, that's the safest place to be in, I know. And that song still rings so true in my mind. Friends, where God has called you, that is the safest place. And I want to end by saying this. Do you know all of us here are under slavery to some kind, of some kind, to something? The Bible says that either we are slaves to sin or we are slaves to Christ. Only these two options. Either you are slave to sin or slave to Christ. Tell you what, I would rather be a slave to Christ than a slave to sin. And Romans chapter 6, verse 17 says, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slave to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And that's what this sermon is about. The big idea, the job description of the follower of Christ. Everything Jesus tells you to do. And so let's adopt, adopt that posture of a servant as we serve the community as a slave of Christ. Impact Now is an amazing initiative to serve God with all our heart. Because one day, one day, in Matthew chapter verses, uh, 25, verse 40, where it says, a parable that Jesus told, the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of these least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And church, I want to just encourage us here, and those of us who have been serving faithfully, what a privilege to be serving God. And why don't we bow our heads right now? And I just want to pray and lead you in a prayer. Are there things that Jesus, your master, has asked you to do, but you have not done? Are there things? And this is maybe going round and round in your mind right now because God has called you to something. And maybe you have not heeded that call in that sense, but it's right at the back of your mind. Has Jesus asked you to give up certain things, not only about what you do, maybe as a career, as a work, or things that are precious to you? Has God asked you to do that? And have you submitted to that call? So my question to you is, what is God, what is Jesus asking you to do? And as you ponder upon that, I want to speak to those who are not Christians here. You know, as, like I said earlier, you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. There's only two options. And I pray that this day, you will make that decision to follow this Jesus because he's a better master than the other master who will enslave you. And so if that's your heart, I want to pray with you. And all you need to do is to invite this Jesus into your life by a prayer of invitation. Now, you may not know everything that you need to do as a follower of Christ, but tell you what, this is an invitation to invite Jesus to walk with you. And then He will teach you as you move along. And I believe that you have been thinking about it for some of you. And if that's you, I want you to bow your head and follow with me this prayer. Remember, it's a prayer or invitation. Whatever you say from your heart, God hears them. So why don't you bow your head? And maybe some of you have backslided away from God. God is calling you back. 
And so you can pray the same prayer with me as well. So why don't you bow your head and repeat this prayer with me. Remember, it's you who is praying to God. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, together in your mind right now, we just pray, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for letting things mess up my life, which you call sins. And sin is running my life without you, and I confess these things to you. Teach me to repent and turn away from them. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins so that my sins can be forgiven. And today, I receive your forgiveness and invite you to come into my life. I want to begin the journey of faith with you and make you the Lord, the master of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, if you have said that prayer, you know what? Jesus heard that prayer. And He will come into your life and begin the journey with you. And so those of you who have said that prayer, this is what I want you to do. Right on the chat screen, there is a raised hand button. Just press that button or right in front of your screen is a QR code. Now, why do we want you to sort of tell us that this is a decision you have made? Because we want to get in touch with you and to give you something to help you in your journey of faith. So can you do that? Thank you very much for doing that because we are really glad that you have said that prayer and let us help you to begin this journey. And so I want to pray for all of us here before we go. And that is that I believe that God has spoken something into your life. So why don't you raise your hands to the Lord and just have a quick conversation with Him and say, Lord, whatever that you want to do with me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to obey you. So will you do that right now, just very quietly in your own heart? Just say, Lord Jesus, here I am. Tell me, Lord, what you want me to do as a servant and slave of Christ. So will you do that right now? And then I'm going to end in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, you have heard many of these prayers and Heavenly Father, you too have heard the prayers of many, Lord, even right now. That in their hearts, some will struggle. Some are struggling, Lord, because of the difficulty in life right now. They're going through a hard time. Some are anxious, some have needs, and some are concerned about their physical health. But whatever that is, God, Lord Jesus, you say, I will never leave you and never forsake you. And so I pray a blessing upon everyone who's going through some difficult moments in their life right now, that Lord, you will minister right deep into their hearts. And if you need a touch of God, all you need to do is go to Him. And place your hands right now in that part of your body that needs healing. Or place it on your heart if you need God to just minister to the anxieties of your life right now. Will you do that? And as you do that, I want to pray that the Lord will minister deep into your life. So Holy Spirit, wherever my brothers and sisters are, Lord, will you go, Lord, and minister right into their hearts right now. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you that you're doing an amazing transformation work in every person. And I seal that, God, in the name of Jesus. And so now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of His Spirit be with us both now and forevermore. And all God's children say, Amen, Amen, Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend.